You were a journalist in Iran for 17 years. What new opportunities have digital technologies created for journalists in the country? Yeah, you know, when uh, the internet and digital uh, technology came to Iran, uh, at the first, uh, I think that it was not very important for journalists. Some young people, general people, uh, used of internet in blogs and uh, their works uh, before the journalists, uh, the journalists in Iran. And uh, after some years, the, this uh, issue, this section, uh, made a wanting like a, a revolution in in Iran in information because uh, thousands bloggers started to write about many things, many things that we as journalists could not uh, write and could not choose of uh, these issues. And that was very important because I think, honestly, we should say that we learned of the general people to how we can do it, how, how we can use of this uh, technology for uh, freedom of expression, for writing about many things that we can uh, we cannot write about them in in uh, our newspapers and journals. And for example, after some years that internet came came to Iran, I started to make a blog and write in my blog about many things, especially about my work in my activity in human rights. You've been involved in a campaign to end the practice of stoning in Iran. How have digital technologies helped the campaign? Yeah, I, I think in uh, these years, some uh, maybe uh, since 10 years ago until now, uh, for many activists in Iran, uh, especially for uh, human rights activists and uh, women rights activists and also uh, many people in uh, student movement. Uh, th th this technology, modern uh, technology, um, made for us an uh, opportunity for uh, making a network, uh, not only just social network, a really network for us. Uh, for example, for that campaign that, that uh, we, which you said, we, when we, we started uh, to have this activity, we should uh, find something about people who, was, who were sentenced to stoning and we should uh, publish something about them that we, can, uh, we could not publish in a newspaper or other journalism. Uh, fortunately, in that time, uh, we didn't have um, too much control by government in on, on the uh, online journalists and blogs and uh, online uh, newspapers, and we could uh, we could publish many things about. Uh, the people who were sentenced to death penalty or uh, stoning, and also we could make uh, uh, we could make it a, a, a network uh, for work together. For example, we had a, uh, um, uh, 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 like a, uh, an online office to work together. To, to inform together, to talk with uh, together, to get some uh, counsel of our uh, friends, other friends. Mm -hmm. and that's very important for us. I, I, I think in it, this opportunity is uh, make that uh, a very good network for many of uh, activists in Iran. What threats do digital technologies pose to journalists in Iran in terms of censorship and personal risk? and in terms of surveillance? You know, uh, as I told you before, uh, after the, the, uh, when, uh, the internet came to Iran, uh, the normal people, the general people, especially young people, used the internet too much. But after some years, uh, some of them sentenced to some punishments 
just for writing in their blogs. For example, one person sentenced to death penalty because uh, because of uh, blasphemy in the, uh, in his blog. It's, of course, uh, they charged him to blasphemy. I don't know about uh, this punishment, but but uh, the punishment for uh, was this sentence, was uh, was this charge, what uh, this penalty? That was a shock for many of uh, people who used of as a user uh, worked with it in the internet and uh, some other things and after some years that journalists also started to make and in their blogs in uh, making some uh, online newspapers and journal, uh, journals uh, they also sentenced to some punishments for example um, uh, we have a lot of journalists now in prison that they um, ha they they wrote just in their blogs or in online uh, newspapers. This threat is not just uh, for sentence to punishment. That's I think it's a mix of punishments and controls that the government uh, do it does it uh, through many things. For example, they uh, approved some law for, for control information in the internet and judiciary helped them to, uh, to, 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 to do it. Uh, then the threat is not just a threat, it's really punishment for, me, uh, for many people. Uh, and uh, yeah. So what can an organization like Penn do? I mean, on the one hand, obviously, we have individual activists who we should say, watch out for malware, and yes, by all means, have the antivirus uh, you know, software yourself. But what can we do as an organization to actually t perhaps address some of the larger issues? Well, I think it's very important that you're issuing a declaration of, of rights in, in the digital world. Um, this is something that is... Uh, critical because the more that people generally uh, become aware of the threat to free expression that exists online, uh, I think the better that will be overall because the, the threats are really growing in my opinion. When we, we stand at kind of a, a precipice right now, um, I think most of us assume that the internet, cyberspace, all of these technologies we have, they naturally lend themselves to enabling more free expression, more access to information. But that's something that I think future historians might look back and say there was a small window, maybe a decade, where that actually existed, but then it was very quickly reversed. And um, that's my fear. So the more that a group like Penn can join coalitions of other like-minded groups, the pressure on governments uh, to uh, enact laws that protect free expression, protect privacy, protect access to information, uh, the better off we'll all be. Mm. So what's your personal sense of the stability of the internet as a vehicle for free expression? I, I, to me it's very fragile right now because you, you have an arms race in cyberspace. By that I mean governments are right now uh, ramping up capabilities to um, fight each other through cyberspace, via cyberspace, via the internet, and that means developing more malicious software, um, uh, developing techniques to actually shut down information at critical points in time during leading up to an election, let's say, maybe a country will disable uh, cell phone access to prevent the opposition from mobilizing. That used to be a rare occurrence, now it happens with frequency all over the world. Um, so, the things that we take for granted about the internet, it, it always being available, I think we have to begin to question. Um, and that's not just because of what governments are doing, it's in part because of technological change. The smartphones that we increasingly use uh, operate on a different ecosystem from the old desktop computers 
WCU to access the internet. Um, they are much more capable of tracking and surveillance. And we're seeing governments use smartphones in order to do that. And that could limit uh, the way in which populations not only express themselves, but uh, organize collectively. So a lot of the things that we take for granted about this technology, I think we now have to question, or at least work harder to protect so that it remains that way. Mm. And what do you think the key issues are in terms of governance of all of this? What, what is going to stop these kinds of attacks from happening and stop the internet from becoming an extremely hostile environment? Well, I think this is the, the unique property of the internet. And, and the kind of digital universe that we've created is that it's a, a distributed, decentralized system. I can communicate directly with you. That would, we didn't need an intermediary to be able to communicate with each other. And it's contributed to a huge democratization of communication and information that still exists. Anyone can tweet whatever they want. They can write something on a blog, put it online. Anybody should be able to read that. That's a remarkable invention in human history. Um, but it's something now that's changing. When I communicate with you, it's not directly to you. It transits through a service provider, usually, which is a private company that stores and retains that information, maybe shares it with law enforcement. Governments are now understanding that they can access that information to be able to shape and limit what you can do as a person. And, and that's changing. It's, it's, unique architecture. So we have to find a way somehow to get back to that while keeping it secure. And it's not an easy question to deal with. Um, so in my opinion, governance of the states, in order for it to remain that way, must also be distributed. We can't have a single centralized body that governs it. It has to be something that's governed from the margins by everybody. And that presumably includes organizations like yours and mine. Absolutely.